microphone or speaker? No, I don't. Okay, so I need theme music. That's one thing I don't have. Yeah. I was playing actual music, but then I thought, well, if I put it on YouTube, they're going to take it down if it violates cop. So I need a, I need someone to compose like some theme music for me. So mm -hmm. hopefully soon. Hopefully well, soon. I, you know what? I wonder if there is a site that has, you know, music that's cleared that you could pull a piece. Yeah, of. I need to look into that actually. All right, it looks like we are live on Facebook, so I'm going to sit back yeah. down here. Okay. Okay, we're just going to wait a few minutes kind of for people to gather in oh, okay. and um, I'll check my phone to make sure people are uh, able to see us and hear us and the technology is, is on our side here. Yeah, I've got my phone here and I'm... Okay, we're all set. So I, I posted something on Facebook. And a couple of people checked in with me, hoping that they could get uh, get online to see it. So hopefully that is working out. And right when this is over, by the way, I download the video and post the link to YouTube, and I'll send you that too. So okay, if right. anybody misses it, no worries. We can, uh, you know. Sorry, where is the link? Pardon? Oh, I'm reading. Some, oh. Arabella Marie sent you a text or an email, uh, not an email, I mean a Facebook message. Where's the link? So go to your name, correct? Yes, Gary Bible. Let's see if I can't. Uh... Okay, excellent. I see people filing into the kitchen as it were. So um, I think we can kind of go ahead and get started. Okay. Okay, so welcome to another week of Hollywood Kitchen. My name is Carrie Bible, and today I have a very special episode. We are going to make Gene Harlow's Hot Rolls, and I've got a very, very special guest. He is a film director, he is an animator, he's working on a big movie right now, and he is one of the world experts on Gene Harlow and has quite literally a museum quality Gene Harlow collection. So, ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Daryl Rooney. Thank you so much, Daryl, for taking the time out to do this today. Oh, it's you're so welcome, grateful. Carrie. You're very welcome. Now, before Our we friends. get into the recipe, I thought we would just start talking a little bit about Gene at the top of the show. Mm -hmm. So, tell me how you discovered Jean Harlow and kind of what your introduction to her was and how you became an expert and her. Uh -huh. Uh, so let's see, it started in my preteen years and uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, you know, movies like Bonnie and Clyde came out uh, that were um, so committed to uh, authenticity, you know, the way they dressed, uh, some of them, mostly the way their hairstyles were, the cars, the look, everything, it was just absolute 1930s. And I just was mesmerized by uh, the style of that time period. Uh, at the same time, all these John Cabal books were coming out on Hollywood glamour photography. And I'd look at all these, you know, sculptured faces and I uh, thought they were so magnificent, but so remote. And then there was a picture of this girl with the biggest smile of sunshine on her face. And she was completely accessible and just there radiant and who is that and you know i just kept on seeing her and i'm like oh she's not like any of the other ones she's completely accessible even though there is this goddess aspect to her so um you know i found out her name and then i'm like trying to find movies and eventually started seeing movies read the terrible book by a mr shulman i'm not going to give his whole name it's fiction don't read it Buy the book, keep the pictures, throw the rest out. Buy this book instead. Yes. This is factual. Buy David Sten's book. It's factual. You know, you know what? On my introduction to Harlow, I had seen some of her films in college. And um, one summer, I got the used copy of the Shulman book at a used bookstore. And I read it, and I was like 21 at the time, but I remember thinking, this book is a total piece of 
gosh. And I went to my film history professor and I complained about how horrible the book was. And he said, well, if you want to read the right kind of book about Jean, you have to read this. And he handed me David Sten's book, uh, Bombshell. Oh, and that was a complete education in a trash book versus a respectful, well-researched, well-written book that really honors and covers someone's life. So that kind of set me on the path to really being discriminating about what I read and what I believed about, about the stars. Yeah, well, you know, that's what's needed because trash books are out there and they will always exist. And I think when you are, when you're a celebrity and then also if you are known for sex, you're uh, a sex symbol, everything is gonna get written about you. It's your fair game. So it's just, it's what you sign on for whether you like it or not. And it makes me sad because to me, I, I say this on my cemetery tour and talk about Jane Mansfield, but these people might be movie stars, icons, sex symbols, whatever, but they're people. That's someone's sister, daughter, friend, you know, mm. and they're human beings. And yeah, yeah. That's so important to, to remember that, you know, and respect that. What is your favorite Gene Harlow film and why? Well, my favorite Gene Harlow movie is Bombshell. Me too. Me on too. Bombshell, and it's because she's in 95% of the movie. First of all, you know, I love Dinner at Eight, but you have to wait for her sequences. That's when the movie really, really becomes alive. Uh, bombshell she uh, great script she's so funny uh it just she looks wonderful the costumes is great uh i love everything about bombshell me and, too i have a weakness for behind the scenes in hollywood type movies you know i really yeah. feel like so you know and i love all the music in bombshell you know that lola burns theme that's lazy bones by hoagie carmichael who knew so everything that's wonderful. You know, another thing I noticed about Jean, I also love Red Headed Woman, and I've been lucky enough to see it on a big screen a couple times at the Egyptian. And her character is like a homewrecker, a gold digger, all these terrible things, but you still adore her. And you're like, it's okay, it's Jean. Like you still kind of forgive her no matter what terrible thing she does in the movie. And that's not easy to do. I mean, it really takes a special kind of likability to put yeah. that away. Well, you know, and that's actually one of the big plights of her early screen career when she was under contract to Howard Hughes and he would loan her out. She was playing gun malls and prostitutes and easy women, uh, unlikable characters, and as she described, unsympathetic. And she just thought her days were numbered because you can only do that so many times before people hate you completely and believe that's who you are. And she wanted to find roles where she was sympathetic so that you could uh, feel something for her. So she got those at Columbia, even though they didn't quite, uh, didn't quite uh, uh, spark, but she was on her way, MGM picks her up and they invent a persona that allows her to be sympathetic and, and she just registers on screen so well. I agree, yeah. I thought we'd start for a minute with talking about the food, the recipe, we'll get into all of that, we'll get the recipe started, and then we'll get back to the, we'll, we'll yeah. do the and all that stuff. Um, this recipe we're going to make today is for Gina Harlow's Hot Rolls, and I got it out of Niji Knight's Hollywood 100 Famous Recipes and Movie Stars. This book was published in 1932, which is the year Red Dust was released, and here's the, the Hot Roll Recipe. So um, I have to say, it's kind of been an adventure making these every every episode because these cookbooks, I think, were written for women primarily, of course, and obviously women that maybe grew up learning how to cook. Now, my mom tried to teach me, and I really had no interest, and most of my adult life, I've done pre-made meals and uh, restaurants, but the pandemic sort of forced my hand, and I've been collecting these cookbooks just for fun, but now I'm actually using them to make so um, a friend of mine who I want to give a huge shout out to, Mary Stanford, exhibited the patience of Joe with me this week and helping me get this recipe together. So thank you so much. Um, okay, Jean Harlow's Hot Rolls. It says, use the following ingredients. So we've got one cup of warm milk right here. I'm going to put this in a separate bowl here. All right, let's see. 
We've got a half a cup of butter and shortening mix. This is about an equal mix of, oh, it's gonna get everywhere. Hang on, I better not touch my fork when I've got butter and shortening all over my hands. Okay, um, all right, here's the butter and shortening. I went ahead and pre-melted this. So I'm gonna put, a friend of mine suggested putting all the wet ingredients in one bowl and all the dry ingredients in another. It doesn't say that in the recipe, but my friend thought that would be easier. Oh, man. <laughs> Every episode is something, I swear. So okay. should you always, Carrie, should you always have the butter melted or doesn't matter? I think it makes it easier if it is, if it's melted or if it's kind of soft. Um, okay. Again, all this is coming from my friend who's been coaching me on these things. Okay, let's see. Um, butter and shortening mix, one half cup of warm water. Take off the warm water here, put all this in a bowl. Um, one egg well beaten, so it will beat, beat the egg here. And then we've got all of our wet ingredients in one bowl. And then we put our dry ingredients in another bowl. Uh, so we've got, it says a cake of yeast. I did not find cakes of yeast at the store, but I did find this, this Fleischmann's. Um, Fast acting. So I'm going to put this in a bowl along with the um, one tablespoon of sugar and a teaspoon of salt. So, and a friend of mine was telling me we were talking about these recipes, and apparently, my friend says that in the 1930s, ovens weren't regulated. And I've noticed that in a lot of these 30s recipes in particular, they don't say how to keep what temperature to put the oven at. And they also don't say how long to put the food in the oven. So it, this has kind of been a real trial and error. Every one of these episodes, I spend at least one or two days trying to work out the kinks and all this stuff, rehearsing how to make it. It's a little more goes into this than people might realize. But OK, I've got my salt, got the sugar. Right. So once we get this going, we'll get back to back to Jean. Let's see. Okay. Um, it says, uh, all right, enough flour to make soft dough. Doesn't give you an amount, so I just have a big bowl of it right here. Set for four hours, which your bowls will rise a fourth inch in thickness. Okay, so I'm just gonna combine all of these things into a bowl and then I'm going to kind of stir in the flour as I can and see how this how this works out but last night I made it and it turned out really really good and I will in a moment show you the final result of how that turned out And a friend of mine told me that the dough should be a little sticky, but not super sticky, but definitely not dry. So I guess since it doesn't say how much flour to add, I guess you just kind of stir it until it feels like the texture feels right. So like I said, I'm kind of new to the world of cooking. So it's constantly a trial and error situation with me. That sounds like a good place to start, though. While I'm stirring this, though, which is going to take a minute, let's talk about other things Jean Harlow liked to eat. Because before I logged on here, we were talking online about Jean Harlow's love of sauerkraut. So yes. why don't you talk about some of her favorite options? I'm going to hold this up to the camera. And of course, I can. Um, do I like sauerkraut? is the headline of this movie magazine article, which is about a group of performers, actors, and their favorite foods. Uh, and I know that she loved sauerkraut. Let's see if I can pull this up. There is a caricature of her with sauerkraut and spare ribs in front of her. Now, uh, in 2011, when uh, we did the book launch for Harlow in Hollywood, we had it at uh, Jean Harlow's uh, former home on Clubview Drive. And I do believe Carrie was there. Yes, that was, that was amazing. And so the owners, uh, Charles and Rebecca Chandler, who were so, uh, so gracious to host the event, 
Uh, Rebecca is a gourmet cook. And so she made some sauerkraut mm, uh, hors d'oeuvres for us. And I, I, it was because I had told her that Jean Harlow loved sauerkraut, but I couldn't find a recipe when I was going through all of my stuff this last week. But I do have, this is how much it says, even though it's the title of the article, uh, it said, those rich luscious desserts are anathema to Jean Harlow, the platinum Venus. Not because she's afraid of getting fat, nothing puts an ounce on Jean, but because she simply doesn't like them, nor candy, nor candied fruit. But put a platter of spare ribs and sauerkraut in front of her, top it off with a couple of slices of raw onions, and your standing with her will immediately rise a couple of notches. She isn't averse to juicy steaks either, but they must be soaked in olive oil and garlic an hour or two before broiling. So there you go. She seems to have loved red meat, steaks, good mid Midwest food. Oh yeah. Um, I did find a couple of other recipes also for Jean Harlow in some of my cookbooks. I found one for a thing called Jody Cakes mm -hmm. and another for a meat pie. But to me, I'm kind of new to cooking and really making a lot of stuff. I figured that starting simple would be best. And the hot rolls kind of seem to be the most basic of her recipes. So mm -hmm. I kind of figured that was sort of my best bet here. So, all right, I've stirred the dough here. I also, I went ahead and put all the flour I had in this bowl in it. Here's what it currently looks like, you wanna see. And apparently I am supposed to cover this put it in a warm area and let the dough rise for four hours, which we're not gonna be here for four hours, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and set this aside. And then here is what the final product turned out like. And I will be bringing some of these to you after the show. Wow, how wonderful. So did you just make like little scooped balls of, uh, 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 the dough, put it on a, on a plate, uh, you know, cooking plate, and uh, t you didn't use uh, cupcake trays, right? I didn't. Basically, what I did is I got some cookie sheets. I put foil and a little bit of cooking spray on them. I worked with the dough and used some extra flour. And then there's so many different ways to do this, but I just kind of rolled it up in a little ball and then set it out and let it rise even more after that. Oh, and then okay. I just put it in the oven. But you can roll it out and cut it. You can put it in shaped pins. There's all sorts of ways you can you can do this. Well, it looks great. It looks very successful. Yeah, I, I'm actually pleasantly surprised. Um, I was telling you earlier that I did this late at night because my apartment is not huge. And if I turn on the oven, like my entire apartment is the temperature of the oven. So right. I did this really late last night. I woke up this morning. My entire apartment smelled like fresh bread which was the most heavenly way on this planet to wake up. And then I thought, you know what? If they made a perfume, Harlow's Hot Roll, I would wear that in a heartbeat. It would be the best <laughs> ever. So um, they really turned out well. And my friend, my friend Mary Stanford, again, so much love to her for helping me with this. Um, she suggested setting the oven to 375, which I did. And I kind of watched these like a hawk. I sat with the oven lights staring because I didn't want to burn them. And oh. I had them 10 minutes and they were still a little gooey inside. So I went about 15 to 20 and I, I kept kind of checking and testing, but I didn't want them to get super, super hard and like burn. So it kind of depends. Some people like the bread crispier. Some people like it a lot softer. So it sort of depends. And again, it doesn't say all these things in the recipe book. There's no temperature. There's no time. To, it's some of this is a little vague, so there's a lot of um, trial and error. But I can honestly say that this recipe is pretty good, and I think the results are excellent. Cool. And so are you going to post the exact recipe on your Facebook page so people... Yeah, I posted the Harlow Hot Roll recipe from the Ninja Nightbook, but what I'm going to do is, after this is over, I'll post what I did specifically to kind of make the recipe a little more accessible to someone that's never made bread before which is, is me so yeah i'll post the here's carrie's translation of this <laughs> definitely very cool congratulations all right now let's get into harlow memorabilia and her life and all the fun stuff now that we have some bread okay so um shall i just pick some random things or 
Yeah, you know, um, I just, I love learning about her because I think that there are certain stars, as I say, that are of their time and there's certain ones that are timeless. And I think there's something so incredibly timeless about Dream. And what would you say is the secret to her appeal and why, you know, all these decades later, she still has huge fan base? Hmm, boy, that's a tough one. Um, I think to me, I can only respond, uh, uh, you know, say how I respond. And I feel like she's somebody who is just very present and she is honestly who she is. She's not trying to portray something else. She is just, she's, she's a girl of sunshine. That's, that's, that's my poetic way of putting it. Uh, here's the first thing I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna get it up close and hopefully uh, not have too much of a reflection. Okay, so this is a picture from the Hollywood School for Girls of the volleyball team in 1924. And this is actually an original. So when you see this printed in a book like my book or other books, this is where it comes from. This belonged to Margaret Toberman, who went to the Hollywood School for Girls with Harleen. And this is her copy of the photograph that everyone's, uh, no, uh, I think she wrote everyone's names on the back. So the real one, I don't own this, a friend of mine owns this, uh, Marne Rafter, but she sent it to me uh, so I could put it in the Hollywood, uh, uh, the Hollywood Museum. It's been so long since I've been there, I've forgotten the name. Which by the way, that museum exhibit you did was phenomenal. I was so honored to get to be there at the opening of that exhibit. And it was so well curated. You, I know you worked really hard. You did a fantastic job on it. It was really great. It, it, you know, it was a remarkable experience. I got to do it twice. And, uh, you know, I look forward to the museum being open again when we're in a healthier post-pandemic world. And, um, there's a small exhibit that still uh, is there and it includes her Rex Rabbit first leaves. So there are artifacts. The next thing, I don't own this either, but I just happen to have it. This is a graduation book uh, from Hollywood School for Girls. Once again, owned by Marne Rafter. And inside, this belonged to a student named Juanita Doubleday. And inside everybody wrote poems and things to Juanita, including Harleen. Oh, in 1923. So I'm just gonna hold it up there for a minute and hopefully people can read it and then I will read it for those who can't. But it's the real thing. It's, it's just, you know, uh, unseen history. So let me get my glasses on and I will read it. So Harleen wrote this poem. Poor old horse had no force and didn't know what to do. He kicked up a hoof and raised the roof and away like the wind he flew. Harleen Carpenter, May 28th, 1923, seventh grade, 12 years old. Isn't that wonderful? Sweet. So, you know, in her world, she would have been a writer. She loved to write. She read avidly. She would have been a writer. And she knew that her days as a movie star were numbered. Nobody ever thought about having a career that would last 40 years. So she uh, was preparing to be a writer when her movie career was over. Do you think um, that she knew she wouldn't live a long time? Do you think she had any sense of that? No, no, I don't think she thought about that. And she certainly didn't know when she went to the hospital that she wasn't leaving. Well, because she asked her maid, she asked her maid, don't forget, bring Gone with the Wind, I'm gonna read it a second time while I'm at the hospital. So, very touching. Speaking of books, this is a book called 10 Boys from History. And this book, And get these things open and to belonged to Harleen Carpenter. So, you know, she was an only child and her amusement were books, uh, the people that worked for her parents 
and pets, animals. Uh, she lived out in the country, so her classmates shouldn't spend as much classmates uh, shouldn't spend as much time with classmates as most other kids did. She uh, so she became very comfortable with adults very early on. Could you talk about also the difference between her signature and her mother's? Because I know that uh, her mother signed a lot of her photos, and there's sort of this dispute sometimes about whether or not something is an authentic. Yes. Well, I just happened to have both of their signatures together on one photograph, oh. and it says it all. So this is a 1932 photograph of Mother Jean and Harleen. And I love this picture. It's taken in the living room, Clubview Drive. Uh, it's her first flush of extraordinary fame at MGM. And this is signed by both her and her mother. I'm gonna try and get it close to the camera. So Harleen has written on the left and hers is very much like a child, childlike scrawl. Mother Jean's is formal and, you know, in handwriting class, she would have gotten an A plus. But this very childlike scrawl and her signature is also very emotional. So sometimes she writes kind of backwards. Sometimes she's very I think um, confident and her signature is big and it's, it's a little more like her mother's but it's never ever uh, measured, controlled and measured the way her mother's is. That's the big difference. Her mother's is very controlled, measured, professional. And so she signed a million photographs for her daughter because her name's Jean Harlow. That's all you're asking for is Jean Harlow's autograph. You got it. You just got the first one is that Jean didn't really want to be a star. This was sort of a lark. And this whole career was just sort of like almost by accident, really, right? It was certainly by accident. She didn't come to Hollywood to be, get in the movies. Uh, she came to Hollywood with her first husband and uh, they were married in Chicago. He came from money. He had a trust fund. He didn't have to work. And she didn't want to stay in Chicago because she hated the cold. So she had spent a couple of years in California. They came back to California, uh, bought a house on Linden Drive in Beverly Hills, a couple of doors down from Clara Bow, and lived a life uh, like an Escott Fitzgerald type of life where they just had parties all the time and there was no forward momentum in their lives. And she got bored with it pretty quick. Uh, and a friend of hers who was an actress, Rosalie Roy, needed a ride to, 20, uh, to Fox, Fox Studios, and she had a car. So she, you know, was curious to see what movies were like, what it was like to be on a lot. She drove her on the lot and she left the lot with letters of uh, introduction to uh, central casting. And that's what started it. That's really remarkable. That blonde hair and, uh, you know, uh, a braless body and striking good looks. Oh, definitely. Well, in some of her early films, she did get bad reviews for being so wooden, but it seems like once she got yeah. to MGM, she kind of transformed, especially with Red Headed Woman. That seems like a pivotal movie. And from her being the stiff wooden actress to being just a totally free spirit yeah. comic symbol. Well, you know, and some of that shows um, what uh, what her personal makeup is, because when she's trying to play a bad girl, she's kind of awful because she isn't really a bad girl. Um, and she also wasn't getting enough attention from directors that she needed. She was new to it. She learned on the job. That's a tough, that's tough to, uh, you know, your critics are your teachers. It's That's very tough. Um, so at MGM, they're much better at making stars and they figured out what works for her, what does not work, and then they would build on it. So, you know, she could be sexy, she could be very, very sensual and very easygoing. And she could also be winsome, which is pretty unusual for someone. And she could also be tough. That's, that's a pretty good range to start with. And, you know, you see uh, red dust, red, uh, red headed woman, hold your man where she's tough, but Winsome, not everyone can do that. So, uh, you know, and then they just built from there and she, 
she, I think, became a really remarkable performer. Not a great actress, a wonderful, wonderful performer and a true, true movie star. Was Clark Gable her most favorite co-star? Yes, yeah, I, I would say so. Um, and they, partly because they came up through the ranks. They were both second leads in The Secret Six and they felt like they were sort of shuffled off to the side and Wallace Beery was getting all the attention from the powers that be and they weren't really sure how am I doing so they would bounce off of each other. And I think out of that came this sort of mutual uh, dependence and trust so that they um, could be really playful with each other but they fed off of each other very well. Um, and so they, you know, I think they called each other uh, sis and, I don't know, brother, whatever. They had more of a brother-sister relationship than uh, 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 you know, a uh, relationship like our paramour. I think it was Clarence, Clarence, uh, Clarence and Clara Boole that said the quote, I've never seen two performers act so in love without actually being in love. I think, I think he's the one who said that. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that's the one thing I think is really remarkable about her is how comfortable she is in her skin. Right from the very beginning, she's just so comfortable and not everyone is like that. Marilyn Monroe, amazingly, amazingly confident and comfortable in her body, you know? And I think that's one of the things that makes somebody very sensual. Barbara Streisand, so comfortable in her body. I, I just, I think that's one of her most admirable qualities. Definitely. And women across the country, maybe even the world, were dyeing their hair platinum blonde to look like Jean <laughs> So she was setting so many trends in terms of her hair, her clothes, everywhere she went was just a sensation. Yeah. Let's see, I've got to find my, I have my bag of tricks here. So let's see if I can get it somewhat. I'm going to this, Daryl, because I've always kind of wondered this. Okay, she, I've read that she, you know, dyed her hair all the time, but wasn't she already platinum blonde to begin with? So why did they need to keep dyeing her hair platinum blonde? She wasn't platinum blonde. She was basically a honey blonde. Ah, okay. But when she got out in the California sun and she was not a girl who would love to wear hats, she was a girl who liked to drive a convertible with the top down. So she got a lot of sun and her hair she had this thick, thick mane of hair and, you know, it really got blonde uh, so that it photographed white. And that's where the idea of, oh, your hair is, you know, an exceptionally light version of white. And it was Howard Hughes and specifically his publicist, Link Korberg, who came up with this moniker that would make it, you know, a high-end specialty type of blonde that's so, so unattainable. It's it's platinum blonde. Uh, she did wear and a wig, right, for Redheaded Woman. She wore a wig for Redheaded Woman, you know, which was uh, a, a partially a gamble with MGM because you're taking the girl who created the platinum blonde craze and you're going to put a wig on her. So if she's really only famous for being a platinum blonde, maybe it's not going to work. So they're counting on her personality rather than her platinum blonde uh, external qualities and absolutely, totally work. Well, I want to kind of get into a little bit of the Paul Byrne um, situation. Uh -huh. I have read that he kind of really believed in her and fought for her with the studio because I know MGM uh, Mayer didn't like the whole sexy, you know, image that Harlow had, but I've always read that Paul Byrne sort of really advocated for her and believed yes, in her. Yes, yeah. Um, I'm going to pull some things while I'm talking. Sure. Yeah, I, you know, the, the movie star Gene Harlow that we know through MGM, I think is the, the actor that Paul Byrne could see long before anyone else saw it as a possibility. And, you know, he knew her personally, obviously. I mean, he knew her personally before she went to MGM. And he... Um, he had a habit of taking starlets that were sort of uh, down and out, having difficulty and to, uh, helping mold them. Uh, he did it with Joan Crawford. He helped out Garbo, all kinds of people. And Jean Harlow needed help. And she had a, a, you know, a, a plight. 
she wants to be seen as a sympathetic actor and she's not getting roles like that. And he could see in personal situations that she was light and carefree and he wanted to get that on the screen. She was funny. He wanted to get that on the screen. She was clever. She uh, could uh, toss out a quip in a, in a very memorable way. And he felt like that's what I need. That's what Gene Harlan needs to be in a movie. So Redheaded Woman was the vehicle that he thought would work for her. And MGM is testing everybody and nobody quite is fitting. And she had gone to New York on a personal appearance tour where she's out on stage learning the hard way how to connect with an audience every single night, you know, doing these routines that were not very good. Uh, and having to take her lumps, but learning how to be professional. So when she comes back from New York in uh, April of 1932, she has polish on her that she never had before. Uh, Howard Hughes agreed uh, during that personal appearance tour to sell her contract to MGM for $30,000. But he would always say publicly that he sold it for 60,000. Because, you know, Howard Hughes is um, Howard Hughes uh, is a publicity hound. Um, or I can see if I can find the one. Is this it? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to pull out. This is a Western Union telegram, and this comes from Howard Hughes's estate. I'm gonna read it because you won't be able to read the whole thing. But this is the telegram that says, sell her contract. This is to his uh, right-hand man, Noah Dietrich. Uh, and it says, please draw a contract with Thalberg for sale. Harlow contract, 30,000. Don't let anyone delay as this, is, as this good deal and don't wanna lose, regards Howard. And that's dated March 19th, 1932. And when I saw this come up for auction this year, I went, that is a piece of absolute history. I, I've got to get it. So at some point it will be at the Hollywood Museum in the future. Come see it when that day happens. So that was very exciting to see this, which David Sten saw, you know, 30 odd years ago. And he was taking all of his notes so that he can use it in his book. So he has proof now it wasn't 60,000, it's 30,000. So, oh, go ahead. So with Paul Byrne, uh, what do you believe changed in their relationship from being the sort of professional mentor and a studio executive to being the spouse? What kind of transitioned that relationship to another level? That, that brought them to being what? From, from being sort of a mentor to her, to being engaged to her and married to her. Oh, that, I see. Okay. They kind of made that difference or made that transition happen. Well, from everything that I've read, which is tons and tons of stuff, um, my take on it, this is just my take, is that, you know, he believed in this girl. He, saw the way she could be and should be, and it worked. MGM buys her contract. They put her in Redheaded Woman where she's got to deliver. She can't be a platinum blonde and just be smart, funny, clever, and mean and sympathetic. Uh, at that time, um, Paul Byrne went on vacation for a month, so he couldn't even guide her through it. She's on her own. He's in South America, he's in New York. He comes back just as she's finishing a redheaded woman. So she did, she attacked that role in a way she had never attacked a role before, which she did effortlessly or what appeared effortlessly ever after. But she's, she is just uh, molecularly different in that movie than in anything that precedes it and she's can't stop watching her. She's funny and she's mean and it's, you know, she's mean to people who deserve to be treated poorly. So you get to laugh with her. Um, and I think that the fact that this incredible thing happened 
and it was going to pay off. She was going to become a big star at MGM along with his absence makes the heart grow fonder. So I think that they, there is this giddy excitement of, oh my God, this really does work. And I can't, I can't talk to you every day. So they are missing each other all the time she's working. And by the time he comes back, she's just wrapping up and they just went, you know what? I missed you so much. I missed you so much. I think I love you. I think I love you too. And I, you know, how real was it? None of us were there to know. It only lasted two months and then he was gone. So we can't ever say, uh, but I think that he understood her in a very deep way that no one else did. And I think that he could also protect her in a way that others couldn't. And he certainly was able to be a barrier between her and her mother and Marino Bello. So that's one thing that's unfortunate is with his passing, she lost the ability to have uh, that emotional barrier that she needed between her controlling mother and herself. And it also seems that from what I've read too, that her, she was denied her dad. Her mom kind of took her away from her father. So she was always kind of seeking a father figure in the men that she pursued and a protector. Yeah. You know, just look at all, uh, not counting her first husband, uh, look at all the men that she dated and married. They're, you know, 40s and mustached. And also we talk about, um, there's a lot of talk about, of course, Paul Byrne's death. I think that we're really never going to know everything that happened. There's just a lot of stuff that went on that's basically unknowable. You know? Well, no, no one was there, you know, the night that Dorothy Millette was at Paul Byrne's house, just the two of them, and they both were dead within like three days of each other. So we're never, ever going to really know what happened. Um, and, you know, the uh, Los Angeles Police Department has made sure it's not easy to get any of that material to look at uh, firsthand. You have to do a lot of digging. And um, I think you have to go up to Sacramento now. All those boxes got moved from Los Angeles and they're up in Sacramento. So I don't know, maybe someday I'll go and make that trek and see if there's anything that I find out. But, um, you know, the other thing is that I don't have, you know, there are people who, oh, Dorothy Millett killed him. Oh, he killed himself. I don't know. I don't know. And I, I, I resist people who are emphatic about it. Uh, one of them, either he did it or she did it, but I don't know. It could be, you know, there was a confrontation that happened uh, on that Labor Day weekend night. And it was a confrontation where uh, there was no escape. So either there was a physical argument, physical um, uh, uh, wrestling, but you know somehow a gun gets involved in there and goes off, but it goes off right at his temple. Usually when you're, if you're gonna shoot someone, you don't put a gun to their temple. Uh, so for people who think that Dorothy shot him, do a lot more reading because the powder burns are on his temple, mm -hmm. uh, you know? Yeah, so, so did she threaten him leave? And then he went, I can't get out of this. The only thing to do is to remove myself or was there a scuffle? And maybe he says, you know what? I, you know, I'm gonna kill myself, holds the gun. And then she does something and, and the gun goes off accidental. We're never gonna know. And I always try to kind of think about what it would be like to be in other people's shoes and to be a 21 year old girl and your second husband has killed himself and you're famous and all of a sudden people are descending on you with questions and journalists and the whole world is on your case. And that had to have been a psychologically incredible stressful situation and it's not mm -hmm. like they would have called in a grief counselor or maybe had resources to help somebody like that that we perhaps would today none of that existed the solution was to close the door and don't look again that was the solution to everything back then just close the door sell the house uh you know that wonderful painting that he had 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 done in the eastern drive house 
She didn't want it. We're closing the door and we're not looking back. Don't want it. And so it ended up getting sold to the man who was hired to uh, uh, paint the house. And it stayed in his family uh, um, up until about five years ago. And now I own it, which was completely unexpected. I wasn't planning on it, but uh, good karma. Did she keep any of Halburn's things at all? Or was it a complete? Well, she, you know, she kept the wedding ring. There's a platinum wedding ring. And uh, one, of, uh, one of the foremost collectors, I can't say who because they want to be anonymous, uh, still has the wedding ring. So it still exists. And it has a tiny little band of diamonds on it, barely perceptible. So one thing that I wanted to say uh, about, uh, you know, Jean Harlow experiencing her husband's death. Uh, when I was working on the chapter for Harlow and Hollywood, and you know, and I have all of this information, and I'm trying to work my way through it, and I just, I just had just like a, a just a breakdown of I just I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, and so I called David Sten, uh, who is my mentor, and he said, "Take it from her point of view. Did she know everything? No." just to say what she knew, she knew next to nothing. So she didn't know any, she didn't necessarily know any better than anyone else. So that was a huge weight off my shoulders. She doesn't need, she can't even tell you the whole story. So as long as you just say, here are the facts, here are the events that happened. Here's something that wasn't publicized, but did happen, that his common law, law wife did come and see him that night. And there is a certain amount of proof that exists uh, you know, Paul Byrne had MGM bring a limo up, a limousine up and drive her to San Francisco. So um, there are things that Jean Harlow didn't know that happened that night. She's kind of in the dark, much the way we are. So interesting. David Stone is outstanding. And I, I think that, yeah, it's just must have been so hard on her. And she went back to the set of Red Dust shortly thereafter and continued filming. And I think Clark Gable is quoted as saying she was the bravest person I ever knew. I would like to think it's a, something true rather than a publicist writing for him. But, oh. you know, uh, the death happened on September 5th. And there's a week where her career is in flux. You know, is MGM going to dump her? Are they gonna uh, are they gonna recast Red Dust? What are they gonna do? And um, everybody's walking on eggshells. And Jean Harlow knows she's just gonna go crazy if she stays at home. And so she called Irving Thalberg and she said, "Let me come back. I just I need to I need to stop thinking about this. At least by acting, she can think about something else and maybe she'll survive." So she came back September twelfth. They shot the rain barrel sequence, which that's asking a lot of somebody who just has gone through a death. Be funny and sexy. And so uh, um, the director, uh, Victor Fleming said, well, you know, she hit all of her marks. She did everything we asked her to do. When we looked at dailies, her eyes gave her away. Her eyes were so sad that they had to reshoot. So they, September 5th, 13th, the next day they come in and they have to reshoot everything. And he told her, this is what you didn't do. This is what I need. So what you see is what she shot on September 13th. You don't see a hint of grief in that, that sequence. Pretty amazing. She's funny. She is so, so funny in that scene. How many people can do what she did? But that's the gift of what she could do, what she could do as a, a performer. Which kind of brings us to another chapter in Hartlow's life because um, when she was shooting Bombshell, of course, she was, she was 21, had the one divorce, her second husband's suicide, or mysterious death, let's put that way. And then she takes up with the boxer Max Baer. And then that comes, that threatens to uh, come to light. And so she has sort of a studio arranged marriage to her cinematographer, Harold Rawson. Yeah. Yeah, and 
I don't think it was a case where, you know, the studio said, Gene, you have, you, we're going to arrange a marriage between you and someone. I think it was more, um, she is going to be named as correspondent in a pending divorce between Max Baer and uh, Dixie Dunbar. And uh, MGM is like, we just pulled you out of the crapper, you know, this last year with all this terrible publicity, you got to fix this. I mean, I think they basically left it to her. You got to make this right. And her solution was, and they might've said, you know what, if you get married, that'll help. And, she, you know, she really, really liked Hal Ross and they dated often. Um, he loved her. God knows. All you have to do is look at the film footage they shot of her. She never looked better. Um, and she proposed to him on the bombshell set. And there he, of course he was shocked and said yes. And he's not somebody who was ever comfortable in front of the camera. So whenever you see photographs and film footage of him, it's not a fair judgment because he's cringing. He does not want to be the center of attention. It's not who he is. You know, he's a gifted cinematographer, Wizard of Oz. Uh, so, and, and very, very good with actors. So um, I think that it was, um, something that she was agreeable to do. Yeah, yeah, I do like him. I like him a lot. I, yes, I guess I love him. I, I'm conjecturing at the moment, but I think she kind of talked herself into it. She's a good actress and did the best she could. Um, and Hal Rawson couldn't deal with Mother Jean and Marina. You know, her mother could not stay out of her life and she became a wedge between Hal and Jean. And even though uh, uh, Jean had gone to live with Hal at um, uh, Shadow Marmont, she got appendicitis after a month, gets hospitalized. She doesn't go back to the Shadow Marmont because Hal's working all day. It doesn't make sense for her to be there. So she goes back to the Beverly Glen home under mother Jean's care and never really went back completely to the Shadow Marmot. She shuttled back and forth by January 20th. I think that's the date. Mother Jean instructed that all of her things be taken back from Shadow Marmot, brought back to Beverly Glen. So the, the marriage was over basically by January. Mother Jean had such a grip on her that was just really disturbing. And, friend that's, said and that's the phrase that Myrna Loy used. I think uh, she had such a grip on that girl. It's really sick. I mean, it's it's not normal, <laughs> you know. It's really well, yeah. You know, at the time, it was seen as something charming. You know, this mother and daughter, this this girl is she's just so loves her mother so much that she can't get through a day without calling her three and four times a day. You know, that plays well if you are known to be a sex symbol who has, uh, you know, kind of a dicey uh, reputation. Um, it endears you to your public, especially women. And ultimately women were her greatest audience. Um, but, you know, the truth is that there was no healthy psychological separation between the two of them. And while Mother Jean would always say, you know, uh, that it was as if we were one person and Marino Bello said that also, it was like they were one person. The problem is they aren't, they're two people. And it wasn't till like 1936 that the daughter tried to psychologically separate from her mother. And uh, so that caused its own friction the last year of her life. And William Powell was the closest any man or anybody ever got to kind of separating that bond, right, with the mother? Yeah, I think that Paul Byrne would have been more successful because he was not going to move into the Beverly Glen house, you know, and they wanted him to sell Easton Drive so that the money would help pay for Beverly Glen and you'll get this whole wing all to yourselves. And he's like, no, he wasn't going to do it. So he was never going to compromise with them. So it would have been interesting to see how things would have gone had he lived. 
don't know, but uh, I think he would have been more successful at, at making there be a separation between mother and daughter. William Powell certainly helped a lot because he's the one who realized when there was the um, interviews for the Time Magazine article in the summer of 1935, where they couldn't pin down what exactly Marino Bello did for a living. He invested Gene Harlow's money in silver mines, gold mines in Mexico, but it's just not really clear. They can't pin him down. And William Powell, who is not a detective, but he is world famous for playing a detective, hired a detective to go down to Mexico to find out what was going on with the silver and gold mines. What was going on with all that money? Because this girl was broke and she shouldn't be. And what he found was there weren't really any silver and gold mines. There, he was just keeping a lot of women. On Jean's money. On Jean's money. And it was the fact that it was Jean's money. But that was the deal breaker for Mrs. Bellow. And so August 19th, 1935 is when the Time Magazine article came out. September 13th, Mother Jean divorces Marino. It's like three and a half weeks. That's how quickly it happened. She was so angry with him because he had mistreated her daughter. It's kind of sad how in Bombshell, I mean, it's a comedy, but there's a whole lot of real life kind of going through that film in terms of the family that's using her while she's working really, really hard yeah. to try to earn a living and everybody's just sort of riding on her coattails. There's, I mean, it's played for comedy, but there's nothing really funny about it in real life. No, you could play the same thing as, as stark drama, uh, but it's really more Clara Bow's life than Jean Harlow's because Victor Fleming had dated Clara Bow and he knew her family really well. So when the script was being fashioned, a lot of the stuff was having fun with Clara Bow's screen character and her personal life. What a mess it was. You know, it's her maid who ended up, uh, she had to take her to court for stolen things you know, which they kind of reference in this movie. So there, there are little nods so that you know it's Clara Bow, but ironically, a lot of it is Jean Harlow's relationship with her family. And her film career shifted so much after the code came in. And then MGM really kind of made her over a bit with the whole brownette hair and kind of gave her very different roles that, well, they kind of had to after the code came in. And it sort of started a whole different chapter in a way in her career. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and the brownette thing wasn't something that, that was planned. What had happened was her hair had been dyed so much for so many years that it had become so dry and brittle that it started breaking off while they were filming Reckless. So she's wearing a wig halfway through Reckless all through China Seas as they're trying to figure out what they're gonna do with her. They can't keep bleaching her hair. She's it's just not gonna be any hair left. Uh, so since they were already trying to figure out where is her career going to go from here uh, and they're going to have to do something with their hair, they decided that they would let it go more natural and um, give her roles that were less brassy. Riff Raff is not necessarily less brassy, but uh, she plays a wife and she plays a character who has uh, more of an emotional range than her other characters usually do. She gets to cry a lot. She gets to be very sweet in Riff Raff. Um, so while she wore a wig in that, her real hair color was growing out. And I think by November, she can uh, go out in public without a wig on. Which brings us to kind of the last chapter of her love's life. She's in love with William Powell and wants to get married to him, but he doesn't want to get married to another blonde bombshell after his marriage to Carol Lombard. Did not yeah. Out. And I think that he, the fact that he didn't want to marry Jean, it seemed to have really broken her heart and kind of put her on a, a downward spiral. You know? yeah. yeah, you know, she, you know, lots of people have had broken hearts and she's somebody who never, you know, when you're a movie star, you get a lot of perks in life. And she probably didn't really have the emotional strength to figure out how to process a broken heart in any kind of particularly healthy way. Um, and her solution was just to go and get drunk all the time. 
And, uh, you know, it was also the same year that unfortunately her immune system was breaking down and she was susceptible to everything. So she was getting the flu, uh, getting like intensely bad sunburns uh, in the, that last summer. Um, oh, what else was going on? With Mental her? problems going on with the time. Yes, and to me, I, I always wonder if she hadn't had um, the dental surgery, I think she would have lasted longer because what happened was uh, she had impacted wisdom teeth and her dentist said, you know what, she's just been this, she's just had the flu. Her system is run down. She cannot have all four teeth taken out, not at once, do one at a time. And Mother Jean didn't hear it. That's too much trouble. So she went behind her own dentist's back and went to a different oral surgeon where they checked her in Good Samaritan Hospital and tried to take all four out. And she, quote, went out on the table while they're taking them out. So while it was never acknowledged publicly beyond sort of, an, uh, I think it was, oh, there's a certain magazine where they got wind of it and mentioned it. And I can't remember the name of the magazine. I don't want to say it incorrectly. Um, but that it was much more serious than uh, how it was publicized. And she spent 18 days in the hospital recuperating from that. Uh, and Saratoga is ready to go. So now she's also feeling pressure to get back to the studio because she, when she's in a film, it employs 80 people. She took that very seriously. And it seems like on Saratoga, from what I've seen in the stills and of course read the books, she doesn't look like herself. She looks kind of puffy and bloated and tired. She doesn't have that hollow spark that she was so famous for previously. Yeah, yeah. she comes in and out. Some, some scenes she looks great, other scenes she's puffy and dark circles under her eyes. Um, part of it also is because she's still draining poison from her gums from the dental surgery while she's back at MGM and she doesn't feel well and uh, one of her best friends Bobby Brown who was her secretary and her stand-in periodically came to see her on the Saratoga set and they're in the dressing room uh, to have lunch together and she said do you mind if we don't talk I just don't feel well today and she said, of course not but she, that was never the way Jean Harlow was so everybody knew that she didn't feel well. It wasn't a secret. Nobody ever thought it was life-threatening though. And everyone knew with her uh, that if she were stayed out late and if she was drinking, the next day her ankles would be swollen, her skin would be kind of slate grayish, that it was always very evident. And it was so evident to Myrna Loy in I think September of 1936, uh, Myrna Loy, William Powell went to San Francisco to shoot some exteriors for one of the Thin Man movies, Gene Harlow accompanied them. And Merloy had uh, a very good friend, um, Saxton Pope, who was a doctor, and asked him to surreptitiously check her pulse to see what was going on with her. And so he met her, held her hand, held her wrist, talked to her, but he's really taking her pulse. And what he saw, what he could tell was that her, her pulse was erratic, that there was a circulation problem. So he sat her down and talked to her about it and, you know, implored her, when you go back to Los Angeles, get a checkup with your doctor, something's going on. And she's like, yes, 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 I will. She's going to be super charming to him and nod her head and not do it. Which kind of brings us to Jane Harlow's untimely death, because no one knew at the time she was dying of kidney failure. I missed the last part. But no one knew at the time she was dying of kidney failure. No one did. No one did. And the only ones that knew when she was going to the hospital uh, that she wasn't coming back were the second doctor that came to visit who was a family doctor and the nurses. They knew, no, she's not coming back. This is kidneys. And there was no, there was no solution to kidney disease in 1937. My great, great grandmother died of it in 1930. So yeah, it was really bad. Stuff. Yeah. We didn't have dialysis, we didn't have transplants, we didn't have anything, even antibiotics. Yeah. So if I have to go for yeah. treatment. Not even antibiotics. Yeah. Yeah. So so at least you know she leaves this incredible legacy on film. 
And what I want to also address is the myth that persists still in some circles that Mother Jean was responsible for her death because she was a physical scientist. Well, She's not responsible for her death. She is responsible for putting her in the hospital to have dental surgery. I wish that hadn't happened. I think she would have lasted longer. But, you know, the whole myth is that, you know, uh, Mrs. Bello is a Christian scientist, so they're not going to have a doctor. They're not going to do any kind of surgery. We're going to pray her back to health. And that's not what happened because Mrs. Bella was actually in Catalina Island when Jean got sick. So she didn't go home, she went to William Powell's house. And uh, Mrs. Bella was contacted, the next day she goes home and Mrs. Bella returns from Catalina from this fishing trip. In the meantime, their uh, family doctor was called, but he couldn't go. So he, took his, he sent his senior doctor, Dr. Fishbow, who diagnosed her and at the time thought it was a flu, gallbladder trouble, put her on, uh, uh, I think, dextrose. Um, and she was awful for a couple of days and then she rallied, but then she crashed. And at that point, Jean Bella freaked out, is in touch with her aunt, Aunt Jetty, who was, uh, who knew the family doctor really well and begged him to come and check Jean. And he did and saw that her uremic levels were high and uh, his senior doctor had uh, misdiagnosed her. So terrible. So what had happened was um, Louis B. Mayer wanted to see Jean Harley, goes to the house and Mrs. Bella does not want to give up control of the situation to the studio so she tells him, you can't come in. We're Christian scientists and we're praying off for her right now. So uh, bad timing to be here. She won't let him in and it's a standoff. So mayor goes back to MGM and says, it's murder. You know, she won't let us fix it. But he also offered to bring in his doctor who was the doctor who had said that Paul Byrne had infantile genitalia. So there's also that. Oh, you want that doctor in here? No. So that's where the myth came from, because that's spread all over MGM. And I, I've seen the piece of paper where Spencer Tracy writes in his diary, Jean yeah. Harley died today, grand today. Yeah. An adjective nobody uses oh. anymore. Grand. She's only six years old. It's really amazing to think about how many movies she made, how many, many things she experienced in those 26 years. I mean, she really had a very, very active, interesting, and unfortunately tragic life in a very, very short best amount of time. You know, it just shows you how much the, those people worked in those years, six days a week. Which is always why when some of these recipes come up, I think, you know, it was probably like Bombshell where she stands at the oven with the potatoes, smiles, and then puts it down and walks away. Because when they're working six days a week, they probably didn't have time to cook their own food. I'm assuming that was pretty rare. She might probably didn't cook a lot because she didn't have to, but she actually was a good cook. And wow. I expect that she probably learned to cook at Ferry Hall when she was in high school. Mother Jean didn't know how to cook. Mother Jean always had cooks and nannies and everything. So she didn't learn to cook till 1938 when she had to get rid of all of her staff. She couldn't afford them anymore. She's the one who would have had the baked potato and she would tell everyone what to do, but she didn't know how to cook. But uh, Harleen did. And so the day of the premiere for dinner at eight, she stopped in to visit her friend, Bobby Brown who was getting ready to have a dinner party. And she's, she was younger than Jean was, uh, who's only 22 at the time. And she's trying to cook this meal and she just, she's not timing things properly. And so Jean says, I'll take care of it. She cooks the entire, preps the entire meal, cooks it for her, puts on her evening gown and goes to the Chinese theater for the premiere. I had never heard that story oh, before. No, yes so and that's from that's out of bobby brown's mouth so you know it's true yeah so that's that's who she really was 
um, have to go to this premiere, but I'm going to cook this meal for you because I know how to do it. I know how to time a meal. Multitasking woman, 1930s style. <laughs> what do you think she would have gone on to do had she lived? Because I always wonder, it's so tantalizing to think about the what ifs. You know? Yeah. Well, I don't think she would have married William Powell. I think she would have been probably unhappy in love maybe her whole life. Uh, but I think she would have kind of had Lucille Ball's career. You know, she was great in comedy and, you know, look, she probably would have ended up on television. I think she probably would have had to work her whole life. Um, you know, she's certainly a big money maker. It would have been interesting if uh, MGM didn't renew her contract and she ended over at Warner Brothers like Joan Crawford did and suddenly in the 40s is doing noir films. Yeah. She could have done stuff like that because she certainly had the had done that kind of thing in 1931. She could have done that easily. I can imagine her also uh, entertaining the troops, being very popular with the troops in World War II. Oh, and wonderful. She was very, very patriotic, a true Democrat, and she loved America. I could definitely see her doing the Bond rallies and entertaining the troops and being a World War II pinup girl. But then it's interesting because Lana Turner kind of became her successor, you know, kind of became the MGM platinum blonde bombshell that I think Jean Harlow would have remained had she lived. Yes, but she would have been, uh, she wouldn't have been the youthful pinup because she would have been much more mature, but she certainly had the goods. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you have some more memorabilia and stuff we can look at? I do. I've got tons. So let's see. I'm going to make this, I'm going to try and make this a little quicker. Oh, whatever. Take your time. I'm having a great time. So, uh... okay. So let's see. Uh, no, that's not what I want to show. Where are you? Here they are. Uh, Gene Harlow's contracts with Howard Hughes. Which he was pretty badly exploiting her financially, right? Like paying her a pittance compared to what she was bringing in. Like everyone who, you know, breaks into Hollywood. Somebody, you know, a producer's job is to take a chance on you. Well, then I'm, you know, assuming the financial burden. So uh, they took her from basic obscurity and put her on, in a lead role in a major film. Hells Angels. And she became a sensation, an absolute sensation at the time. Uh, I think it was probably more unexpected than anything. And um, there was no next movie because he wasn't in the, in the business of keeping stars working. He would just sort of make them and use them for promotional devices. But there, was, there were no the next movies. He just didn't operate that way. So these are not... Trying to find the order. Yeah, where are you? Oh well, back with it. So this is one of her contracts with the Cattle Company, Howard Hughes's company, and this is dated January twentieth, nineteen thirty. And so what happened was her first contract with Howard was in October of nineteen twenty nine, and she's getting a hundred dollars a week. Every six months. The Caddo Company has an option to pick up her contract for $50 more every six months. So in whatever six months from that is, I think the next one became January of 1930, then July, July to January, uh, Howard Hughes would pick up her contract. So I think by 1932, she's getting $200 a week, maybe 250. And she wants out of this contract. It was actually, Paul Byrne, who uh, convinced Howard Hughes to loan her to MGM and, you know, you name the price, we'll pay it. He gets $1,000 a week, she gets her 150. So it's a good deal. So that's what happened all through 1931. And so each one of these contracts, there are four of them where she's just signing away her life for $150 a week. So let's see. Anyway, so that's one thing. 
here it is. This is this is her contract, the first very first contract with Howard Hughes from 1929. On the second page, she has signed. I'm going to make it really big for everyone to see. There's her signature, 18 years old. 17 years old, 18. And you know, written kind of backwards, which implies, I think, to, uh, it's emotionally not feeling confident. So I think she probably feels intimidated by this whole scenario. She's so young. Like, say that again. She's a teenager. She was so young. I mean, it's, it's understandable. Yeah, yeah. So let's see, got that. Oh, I'm gonna, I had showed you this earlier. I'm gonna show this now. In 1933, she bought a 1932 Packard and was, you know, heavily photographed with it, drove it around town uh, like a convertible with the top down, always, never had the top up. And um, the back seat, it's, you know, two seaters. The back seat um, had doors where you had to lift uh, part of a metal thing up and get in, kind of like, like if you're getting in uh, some kind of weight reducing machine and then you close this thing. So it required somebody else to get you in and out of the car. It's not very efficient. The inside of that piece that lifts up is right here. It's this navy blue leather and the owners of the Packard gave it to me. And this is terrible to kind of show it on the screen because I can't show you the whole thing, but it was on exhibit at uh, the Hollywood Museum and perhaps will be again someday. You had her car up there too. That was a yes. epic undertaking. Twice, twice. Wow. And you know, the great thing about the car, it's in great shape. Uh, it's only ever had three owners ever. And uh, so it's very easy to trace its history and it will ex it will stay in the Gooding family forever, because uh, 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 Cliff Gooding and his wife have willed it to their nephew, who is a car fanatic. Oh, that's great! And so, and he so he has the wherewithal to look after it, so it will be taken care of forever. So that's very good. Uh, I've learned that I don't necessarily have to own things in the Harlow world. I just need access. That's all I need. <laughs> so, and it's nice when it's people that are, are very uh, charitable because Cliff Gooding was like, oh, you want to borrow our car for six months and put it in a museum? Okay. He was like a big kid. It was, uh, he, they were very, very nice. You've always been very generous. I mean, for my book, Hollywood Celebrates the Holidays with Mary Mallory, you gave us Harlow photos. You've been so kind and generous to people with your materials and your knowledge. And, uh, you know, I just have sort of learned that what good is it if nobody ever sees it? If you can't share it, it's kind of like not really having it. I don't understand some, some collectors have this very protective uh, hoarder mentality where it's like, it's mine and, and nobody else can see it. And, and uh, I, don't, I don't understand that. It's, it's better if you get to celebrate that person, even if it's just through objects, but other people enjoy it and are, you know, to get to touch something that Jean Harlow touched is amazing. Do you have any other items you'd like to show us before we start taking questions? Um, sure. People would think this is terrible that I have this loose, but I, it's because I pulled it. This is the Grand Hotel Ledger that Jean Harlow and Paul Byrne signed on April 29th, 1932. And let's see if I can find their signatures and line it up. I think there it is. Hopefully people can see it. So the previous owner who bought this had it professionally cleaned and it wiped out Chester Morris's signature. Oh, no. Ridiculous. So much for bad preservation work. Anyway, this is the real Grand Hotel Ledger. Which are oh, I think you have been signing it together walking into the premiere. Say that again? The photo, I think, that's floating around of them signing it, walking into the premiere. Yes, you know, and, and what's, woman. what's interesting about this is that this is one time where her signature is like really neat and measured. And 
that's not the way she typically signs. And so, you know, I thought, I was thinking, oh, she's at MGM now and she's trying to, you know, put on her best face and this and that. And then if you see the um, film footage from the premiere, she's signing and then she says, I can't write with gloves on. That's why she's writing so neatly because she can't get a good grip on the pen. Something as simple as that, very funny. Uh, let's see, here's my bag of, uh, if there's ever fire in my house, the dogs go out and then this goes out. This has a ton of things. Uh, this is a letter, it's actually written on both sides. It's um, her father Montclair Carpenter's letter to Howard Strickling, talking to him uh, about Jean Harlow, thanking him for taking care of her all those years. This is after she's died. And another one to Marino Bello. Thank you for taking care of my baby. So, you know, what a, what a gentleman he was. I've gotten to know the uh, carpenter side of the family really well, the uh, descendants, and they're just all just, just the best of Midwest people. And freakishly photogenic, too. That's one thing I discovered. Uh, Jean Harlow is so much a carpenter. She's more a carpenter than she is Harlow Williams. Uh, the cleft in the chin, uh, the cheeks, the square front teeth, that's all carpenter. And her disposition is very much a carpenter. And um, so when I met their family, mother, family members, so many of them had those squared off teeth. They had the same cheeks. And it's just like, oh my God, you have the same features. So it's, it's very heartwarming to see it as part of a family system. Um, but let me read this thing just because I, I'm, I have great affection for Montclair Carpenter. Mr. Bellow, you were so very kind and thoughtful on my behalf during the trying days of our great sorrow that I, I wish to thank you again. Especially am I grateful to you for telephoning me so promptly also, I believe you are sincerely devoted to my little daughter. And for that, I respect you and wish you well. Sincerely yours. Classy, classy man. So, you know, it's unfortunate their marriage didn't work because he, I, you know, he was very stable and he was very stabilizing influence in her life. She did stay in touch with him, but it was always surreptitious till towards the end of her life, then I think Mother Jean had gotten, released most of her frustration and anger that she would allow them to correspond. And uh, Montclair was actually gonna come out to Hollywood in the summer of 1937. So instead he came out for her funeral. Uh, let's see what I've got in here. This is Montclair's personal picture of Harleen. Hold it up there. Darn the sheen. Hang on a second. I'll take it out. I try to keep everything protected as much as possible. And people with greasy fingers like me. You know, and this is the kind of thing that shows up after you do a book. These one of a kind pictures show up and you go, ugh, why? But David Stanack had actually told me when this book, when your book comes out, so many things are going to come out of the woodwork where you're just going to go, why not? Oh, it's true. Incredible things have come out of the woodwork. One of the most amazing things that happened was the painting that was done uh, after she died, Farewell to Earth. For people who don't know, it's a painting that Mrs. Bella commissioned and uh, it stayed with her until her passing. She gave it to her closest friend, Ruth Hamp, who then went, it went to her relatives on her passing and then in the 60s just disappears. It was missing for 50 years. David Sten put it in his book to see if somebody would find it. A psychic had told him the painting wants to be found. So he wouldn't stop looking. So when I did my book, I had the picture of the painting colorized, put it in my book, hoping that somebody would go, hey, that's, that's in the secondhand store just around the corner and it would be revealed. So it didn't happen that way, but all the toggles in the universe switched and ultimately the painting fell in my lap and I was able to rescue the painting with the help of some other people and it has been restored, preserved and will exist forever in Hollywood. 
As it should. As it should, as it should. So let's see. Uh, when Harleen went to Ferry Hall in Chicago, uh, movie magazines always said, oh, she was a tomboy. She wasn't interested in boys at all. She couldn't understand, you know, the interest that they seemed to have in her. None of that's true. She was very boy conscious. She dressed so that boys would notice her. And so this is a letter when she's in Ferry Hall, she's uh, 15, 16 years old to her 21 year old suitor. And his name was Howard Baldwin. And she's 16, but she can get a 20 year old, 21 year old boyfriend. And they remain friends for the rest of her life. So she wasn't somebody who had casual acquaintances. He became a family friend, which is, tells you something about the girl. Um, so um, I'll read this just so you get a sense of, she's a little coquette. She's not a, tom, she, eh, she's not a tomboy, she's a little coquette. She was raised by her mother to be a coquette. That's the thing I find interesting. Uh, Howard dear, I've been quite some, uh, I've, I've been quite some little time, um, Oh gosh, it's hard to read her writing here. Um, something your letter, uh, but not from choice. I've been so terribly busy studying, believe it or not. I was coming down to Chicago today, but it's too cold for little me. I can't stand the weather. Do you ever think of me? You should if you don't. I've never been able to tell you how much I enjoyed my evening with you. I only wish I'd not had to take that train. This isn't such a masterpiece, uh, but I've got a class in a few minutes. And so had to let you know that I remember very well. Write to Harleen as soon as sooner, always me. What a little tease. So she's not a tomboy. But, uh, you know, and that's the thing that was so interesting was to see how her mother raised her. She raised her to be a Lolita. You're going to marry a rich man. And, you know, her mother, they would uh, go to hotels for lunch, for luncheon, and you know how stylish and classy that was? Mother <laughs> Jean is just looking for rich men, of which she found a couple, thought she hooked one with Marino Bello, but oh, he fooled her. He thought she was rich, he thought he was rich. She got stuck married to a guy who didn't have money. Blew it. She was not happy about that at all. But she raised this girl to use her feminine wiles right from the right from the very beginning to get somewhere in the world. So she understands the character of Lil Andrews in Redheaded Woman very well. And her mother is a gold digger. So I think in a lot of ways she's playing her mother, completely driven and determined. This is a Christmas card. And this is done, the illustration is done by a guy named Morgan Dennis. And this is from Chuck and Harleen in oh. December, 1928. And this was to Rosalie Roy and her husband. So the fashionable thing back then was to do printed Christmas cards instead of personalizing them. But it comes from Rosalie Roy, the real thing. Uh, let's see. Oh, you're looking for that. Let me, let me check my phone and see what kind of questions. Oh, that's a good idea. I'll mention one other one while I'm here. This is Harleen's contract with uh, Hal Roach. Hal Roach Studios. And this is actually the addendum to the contract. This is dated December 27th, 1928. And this is basically a follow through with the contract saying that when you... Uh, you have to have uh, a parent on the set because you're underage. That'll be Mrs. Bellow. You furnish your own shoes. We uh, furnish clothing. You furnish your own underwear, uh, things like that. And then it's signed Harleen McGrew II. I'll bring that up close so people can see it. 
Okay. Uh, Marty Raptor is saying, Daryl, do another book. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I've been thinking about it a lot. And because, you know, the, uh, a book is a tip of the iceberg of the research that you do if you do it properly, if you do it well. And there's so much that couldn't be said in Harlow and Hollywood because the book was about Hollywood. Uh, everything that happened to her before she became a movie star in Hollywood is just touched on. So I'm thinking that there's a second book called Harlow Before Hollywood. Oh yeah, why not? And she, um, she had good friends at Ferry Hall, the, uh, the school that she went to for high school in Chicago area. And um, a friend of mine, Dennis Lee Cleveland, interviewed, interviewed three or four of those girls for like a year or so. Um, and I made an arrangement with him uh, to get all of those interviews. So uh, none of them, none of it ended up in the book because it's not about Hollywood but it's everything about her and her uh, relationship with her mother and the stepfather who comes into the scene. Uh, and it's, it's who she was before she became a movie star. So I think that that would probably end up being the meat of the book. But I, I think that's the, the piece of her story that hasn't really been told enough yet. Yeah. So someday, Harlow before Hollywood. Here's some of the questions I'm getting. Uh, Daryl, uh, from Barbara Brew. Daryl, how much do you know about Paul Burns' first wife? Oh, not very much. I've never researched her. Uh, I know David Sten did some research, so I'm going to say that that's sort of the extent of it, pretty much. Uh, the only other things I've read are things that um, I, I, buy, I buy a lot of scrapbooks uh, because you never know what you're going to get. Sometimes you're going to end up with gold. And for me, in the beginning, it was always, uh, oh, I love scrapbooks with pictures. But then it became, I want scrapbooks that have any little piece of information. And so in some of these scrapbooks, I found little blurbs about Dorothy Millett, uh, things that happened after she died, uh, where um, uh, uh, things like uh, in the stateroom of the ship that she was on, she disappeared, she jumped off a ship, uh, a boat. Um, and in her stateroom, they found, let's see if I can remember this correctly, um, indentations on a page that uh, when they put black pencil on it, it reads justification. That's cryptic. What does that mean? Whoa. She's, she's dead that night. Yeah. So uh, I don't know enough to be an expert at all. Um, Catherine Boyd is saying, isn't her agent Arthur Heimdall buried at Hollywood forever? Uh, yes. Yeah. He's hiding somewhere. We, I, I don't know. You, I know you've seen him, his yeah. trip. I it's have not. Really, it's really hard to find. I've found it a few times, but it's super obscure. And frankly, I just haven't uh, been over to that part of the cemetery in a while. But he is there. Uh, but Harold Rawson is there. Harold Rawson is there with his family, which is very nice. And then two of her closest friends are also buried there, Carmelita Garrity Wilson and her husband, Carrie Wilson. And what's interesting about them is Carrie died first. He died in 66, she died around 76, 77. And I guess in her grief, she didn't think to buy two plots together. So when she died, she couldn't be buried beside her husband and they, were, they stayed married their whole lives. So she's, you know, about a hundred yards away, and it's always kind of a, a juggling act to find them both. So Mary Davies and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. People that were in her social circle or that she Absolutely. knew in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, Benjamin, are there relatives of Jean that you know? Are there relatives? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, all the relatives that I know are on the Carpenter side of the family, and they all live in Kansas, uh, in uh, Wichita, El Dorado area. And they are Montclair's brother's grandchildren or great grandchildren, I forget which, how many generations it jumps down. But, you know, they have family letters that mention Harleen. They're, uh, 
there's it, one thing that used to happen back then was that there were family letters that traveled around. So it would go from one relative to the next and they would all read it. They might add to it. And so there's a letter uh, uh, where uh, one of the family members is complaining because she wants to be a movie star and her family won't, you know, send her to Hollywood and pay her way. This is one of the carpenter, one of the errant carpenter kids. And she's, uh, you know, and she insists that uh, Harleen had encouraged her. Yes, you, you should come to Hollywood. You should give it a try. And so she has written in, in between the lines, see, I told you something like that. So every family has them, but the Carpenter family, really, really nice people. Uh, one of her descendants through her uh, uh, Mont's father, her grandfather, great-grandfather, Bryony Barnes got married five years ago and they invited me to the wedding in Wichita and I went. And it was fantastic. And it was held at the uh, Kansas City Municipal Airport, which is now a museum, which is where Mont traveled through in 1937 when he went to Hollywood. So I had this other reason that I wanted to go, but I just had the best time. Monique is asking, um, Daryl, did you try any of Jean's recipes? Did I try any of her what? Her recipes, Jean Harlow. Oh, recipes. no, I don't. I'm not a, I'm, I'm a worse cook than Carrie. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're no. Gonna, you're the show, I'm going to leave these on your doorstep. So you're going to get some of the rules. I'm looking forward to it. No, I, um, I just don't love being in the kitchen. I cook okay. I just don't love to cook. So I do it as little as possible. But I do uh, certainly encourage other people to make Jean Harlow recipes and, and, uh, and give me them. Uh, which is what we did when we did the book launch at Club U Drive. So that was really fun. There's a lot of really good questions here too. Um, huh? Let's see, uh, what happened to Bello after Jean died? Uh, Catherine Boyd is asking. Well, you know, one thing that's really interesting is that he just wouldn't really get out of Jean Bello's life. Marino, you said Marino, right? That's just, she's oh, asking. what happened to Marino Bello? Yeah. Um, this one of these traveling family letters that had started in uh, like May of 1937 and then traveled through June, where her great aunt Jetty is the one writing the letter. Um, and it talks right through Jean's passing. And before that, she says, Oh, Jean and Marino were together last week and mentioned something about them. And it's just He's at loose ends, so he's still hanging around. So that was an, uh, enlightening to find out. And I think he just he didn't really work for a living. He lived off people, so he still was trying to get something out of Gene Bellow. So luckily, he was there to help when when Harleen died, which he did. So you know, he uh, he was the feet on the ground for that. So uh, they, uh, you know, he helped her all through that helped Mother Jean all through that time period. He eventually married a young girl, 18, 20 years old, you know. I think she saw him as a, a, a stepping stone to something better. That's around 1940. And he's sort of hanging around with gamblers offshore of Los Angeles. Uh, so things on the edge. And I think she, she finally wisened up and dumped him he ends up marrying another woman. So when he died in 1953, he was married to whatever this is, one, two, fourth wife. I think her name is Violet. And they live up two miles from me. I used to go to a restaurant called Mexico City all the time. Oh, I remember that place, yeah. Yes. So one time Brian Bundy and I were gonna go there. And so he was over here and we were looking through scrapbooks and he found Marino Bello's last address, 4448 Ambrose Avenue. And he goes, oh, we should go there sometime. I'm like, oh, yeah, let's go eat. So we go to Mexico City. We can't find parking. So we have to drive down a street to park. What do you think the name of the street was? Ambrose. Ambrose Avenue. That's so perfect. And we're like, oh my God, that's where he lived right there. This is where we're parking. How ironic. So things like that happen some once in a while. Um, we're getting a question. John McDonald. Hey guys, watching you guys in Ireland. Question for Daryl. I love Ireland. 
you think you'll organize another Jean Harlow house visit afternoon? I missed the last one by minutes the last year. Oh, yes. Oh, that was so frustrating because I, I even went to try and intercept him and I just couldn't find him. Uh, it'll happen again. Check in post pandemic world. Marnie Rafter is asking, Mother Jean ran an antique shop somewhere. Do you know where it was located? How long has he had it? Uh, I have not been back to Palm Springs or Palm Desert um, in, uh, I'm going to say 20 years now. So I don't know specifically, but I know it was out in Palm Desert. And I would bet that it's easy to get the address of that store because I know that there is a picture of the store in, in a newspaper from whatever year that was. You're getting, um, did she have anyone to watch out for Mother Jean in her silver years, maybe the hemp's? Uh, I didn't get that one more time. The, the, uh, Marnie Rafter is asking, did Mother Jean have anybody to watch over her in her later years, maybe the hemp's? Oh, I'm sure Ruth Hemp, a lifelong friend. Uh, and I think anyone that's listed in her will are people that also help take care of her. Um, you know, William Powell certainly took care of her financially in a certain way uh, after uh, Jean Harlow died. He arranged a contract with MGM for her to be a reader and a talent scout. And she got a seven year contract at like, I think $250 a week. So it's like a $50,000 contract that ran for seven years. And that's the power of, of being a movie star at MGM. Because he his contract was also up for uh, renewal. And he just said, I'm not inclined to uh, renew my contract with you. I'm tired from being overworked unless you do this. And so the lawyers had a fit, but they did it. So she was taken care of that way, that way Bill Powell didn't have the burden of looking after her because Mrs. Bella was used to other people looking after her. Uh, she married a second time or whatever that is, third time, whichever it is. Uh, and it, it, she had the marriage annulled within a year or so. Uh, she certainly had lots of uh, celebrity friends, Luella Parsons, uh, Rhea Gable. And um, she had her circle of friends, Ruth Hamp, and um, other uh, stage mothers that she knew from when she and her daughter were first coming up through Hollywood. A woman named Sally Collins was a really close friend and she even left her things in her will. Uh, Karen Paulos is asking, how many silent movies did Jean do? And how tiny was Jean? She looks very petite. Five, three and a half. Um, silent movies, um, I've never counted them up, but I'm probably not more than three or four, I'm gonna say. Double maybe double six, double. maybe six, where they're, it's minimal, it's a walk-on. Or a walk-on with a comedic bit. That'll be in uh, Harlow before Hollywood. <laughs> I'm not sure it is. All right, well, I think that's about all the questions, but if people have more questions, I'm sure you would be more than happy to answer them on Facebook and uh, you know, leave a comment or write them back. Yeah. Right, and well, I, I can also let Marnie know that all of her stuff is very safe here. Marnie left me some things uh, to have in my care, like this gorgeous picture. Hmm. So it's still here, it's still safe. I still pretend it's mine, but it's not. Any so, other final thoughts you have for us or things you'd like to show us? Well, I have, well, oh yes. Look at this color photograph. Oh, that's beautiful. So this is uh, a James Doolittle 1937 color, natural color photograph of Jean Harlow taken during Saratoga. And it has been, this is obviously a digital print but it's uh, Victor Mascaro who went in with all this new computer technology to uh, sharpen the image because this is a three strip color photo, red, yellow, blue, where they would put the three layers together. Well, they didn't put the three layers on exactly together properly. So the original is slightly out of focus. How frustrating, she's a major star. They should have been more careful, but with all this new technology, Victor was able to go in and sharpen it again. So it's magnificent. 
there's that. There is also one of the most recent things I got. Where did I put you? Uh, I found this thing on eBay, which I'd seen once before and didn't win it. So I did win it this time. And when it arrived, I had no idea it was this big. It's a Kleenex ad. It's so great. It is very large. So it has a lot of water damage, but luckily not around the face at all. But um, Suzanne Friend, who runs Conserve Arts Inc., uh, does paper restoration. So just because this is so rare, I think I'm going to have her look at this, tell me how much she thinks she can restore it, and probably spend the money to stabilize it. What would you say is the crown jewel in your hardware collection, like your most show-stopping piece? Hmm, pretty tough to say, you know, because... It is. I've it been is. in the house, it is tough to say. There are, uh, there are crown jewels for different reference points. Um, but uh, I think the thing that's that's the most hard to find are personal items and uh brian bundy has a large number of them he's an, an amazing collector and he actually sold me her rex rabbit fur sleeves so i do own them and they're on display at the hollywood museum in the old max factor building which is currently closed when it reopens they'll still be there but i also i own the 1932 ignaziev mural that was painted and installed in Paul Burns' Easton Drive home. I never planned to own it. I just found out who owned it through Lisa Burks, sweet talked them to borrow it for the Hollywood Museum and also to put in my book. And they ended up learning so much about the painting just by me talking to them and establishing a, a really good friendship with them that when the owner passed away, his kids called me six months later and said, so we all had uh, talked about it and decided that you should own the painting next. So we just have to agree on a price. So they had a second mortgage on a second house. I paid off the second mortgage and I took the mural home. And I'm glad this stuff has found such a loving and appreciative. You know, and the other thing about that is, is the clock is ticking and we aren't going to survive and paper goods survive. So I'm just a steward. It needs to go somewhere. It's gonna go somewhere after I'm gone and it's up to me whether I can have any kind of control over that. So a couple of us major collectors have actually started having conversations, you know, where's a place where all of these could go together so that Harlow's legacy is in one place. So stay tuned, maybe that will work out. But it's, yeah, it's, so it's, it, right now it's my responsibility to try and take care of that. Thank you so much for taking, we've almost hit the two hour mark. I think this is- Oh my God, yikes. Okay. Ever. <laughs> well, well, good. And so fascinating, and the time has flown right by. Yes, I thought that was only an hour. Look yeah. at this, hey. <laughs> So basically, we'll just, um, after I get off the Zoom call here, just roll out that yeast and little dough balls on a cookie sheet about 15 to 20 minutes at 375 and Harlow Hopkins. That would so be wonderful. Thank you so much for taking such a huge chunk of time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate this. And I really hope Harlow fans from around the world have appreciated it and enjoyed getting to see this as well. I hope so. I'm trying to think of one last thing I can show you guys. I know what I'm thinking of. I just have to see exactly where I put it. Uh, one of Harlene's best friends was Bobby Brown. Did she ever sign any pictures to Bobby Brown? Yes, she did. I've never exhibited it. It's right here. Don't fall over. So this is taken in October of 1932. And it's at a golf course. 
October, I think it's October 14th, 1932. And it says uh, to precious Bobby with my love, Jean. And I'll see if I can get the signature up close. That's awesome. So I've just, I've never put it in the exhibit. First time anyone's seen it. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. So anyway, well, this was lots of fun today. I look forward to uh, taste, testing the rolls sometime uh, in the next couple of hours. I'm sure they'll be wonderful. I only live like 15 minutes from you, so yeah. I'll be very soon with some rolls for you. Oh, and one last thing. Yes, thanks. Wait, well, damn it. Okay, so. For anyone who does not have Harlow in Hollywood and you'd like to get an autographed copy, uh, check through Carrie Bible or uh, private message me and we can make arrangements. I'll sell them for $40 each autographed plus uh, tax for Uncle Sam and shipping. All right. Well, thank you so much. And if you can't get enough of Harlow, which I think we're all in that camp. Um, at four o'clock today on the West Coast, Kimberly Truller, the fashion expert and historian, is doing a Jean Harlow pre-code fashion lecture. You are not gonna wanna miss that. So if you love Jean, today is your lucky day. It's a Jean Harlow double header. So definitely check that out, glamamore.com. And I will post another link on my page here as well about it. That's a good Jean Harlow day. I think so too. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks to everyone for watching. I hope you learned some things. Thank you so much, everybody. And I'll talk to you very soon. Happy Harlow days. Okay, let's see.